I'm pleased to be here today. My name is Steven Zagarianakis from Netronome, and I'm going to, I have the pleasure of talking about massively parallel risk processing with transactional memories. Before I uh, get into the presentation too much, I just want to do a shout out to Rajiv Didhassan Varan RV, as he's called, for his collaboration on this material. Today, we're going to discuss how do we build up a RISC-V into thousands of processors? We're going to discuss transactional memories. We're going to do a walkthrough through an example application utilizing the transactional memories in RISC hearts. Uh, we're going to start at the full chip level and work our way down to an island cluster and groups of RISC-V hearts. We're going to talk about the modifications that are required uh, to tailor the RISC-V for our embedded application, which is a smart NIC uh, marketplace, and then maybe talk about a little bit of summaries. Before I get too far into the heart of the application, I'd like to uh, say a few words on multiprocessor cores and memory hierarchies. In the past, um, such systems needed to utilize a custom approach or shoehorn in a standard processor. Um, with the advent of the open architecture, RISC-V, we have an opportunity now to merge the two. We have the opportunity to tailor the um, instruction set and customize um, the optimizations we want to make to the RISC-V itself. This allows us to have the ability to support multiple embedded applications. The transactional memory part of this gives us a second opportunity to tailor the embedded systems and put the memory and memory hierarchies where the data needs to arrive in the systems. What is transactional memories? We speak a lot about in the current architectures about cache architecture where we try to get the data as close as possible to the CPU so the CPU can ha have the ability to work on the data uh, with the lowest amount of latency. And that works well for most applications. Transactional memory switches that around. It actually tries to put the execution unit as close as possible to the memory and have the execution unit execute on the memory itself. Uh, there are several examples of operations that this works well with. Um, fire and forget. What do I mean by that? A command that you can issue to the memory that you don't want a response back. Several applications that work well for this. In, in networking, we have to keep track of statistics about the packets, the system, and other things, which require a multiple of semaphores or atomic operations to be performed to the, to the memory structure. With a transactional memory, you can issue one command and multiple of the uh, statistics will get updated in one shot. Operations that require uh, collaboration to, uh, between multiple CPU hearts. It basically allows the, the memory itself to be the sync point of the operation versus having to go back and forth between the hearts to synchronize data up. Um, how does it actually work? A command is issued from a CPU, RISC V in, in this case. The command includes the information that's required for the operation. It includes where the data um, resides in the CPU that the operation needs to have. It includes the memory range that the operation runs on, and then it re, uh, includes the how to terminate the operation, whether the processor needs to be signaled or woken up when the operation is done, or it doesn't need any uh, return information. The type of transactional operation, some of them are listed here on the chart, could be as simple as atomic operation, CRC calculations on a range of uh, memory location, all the way up to doing a full decrypt or encrypt of your packet coming into the system. One of the things I do want to mention, trans, the, the goal of transactional memory operation is not to affect the normal C 
execution of the code. So we follow all the standard constructs for doing standard C execution. So how do we build up a, a, a full chip with a thousand processors on it? You can't have them all at the top level of the chip. So we have the concept of implementing islands, which are self-contained units that allow for building blocks that can be placed anywhere within a fabric. They include all necessary components to do the testing as if they were a single chip. The islands allow us to implement a building block approach from very small to very large chips. The memory hierarchy here for embedded applications, we require some of it needs to be cacheable, some of it isn't cacheable. And one of the things that I want to go mention here is the, the reason we have the memory hierarchy support we can support all types of memory transactions, spread the transactions in data bandwidth load across locality of application processing. So we can distribute the load of the system as the data comes in. And I'll go through a few examples of that when we walk through the life of a packet. The, the basic building blocks of our chips come into uh, three types. One is how do we get the data in and out of the chip? They, they have the I.O. capability. Their interfaces, the network interfaces, PC. If we're doing coherent buses, it would be like a C6 or some other coherent protocol. It would also be the configuration bus that we have here and the host interface uh, buses. So data in and out of the chip. The second level is actually the memories. What we're showing is at this level is two types, direct access memory, which is a SRAM based, and cache back memory, which can either be DRAM back cache or host memory back cached. And then, of course, islands and islands of RISC-V processors. Basic flow of a packet. I just wanted to give you some idea of how a packet would travel through the system. I'm, just, I'm going to start with the example as we have, assuming today's marketplace is currently 100, 100 gig NICs are commonplace. Uh, we, we produce 25, 50, and 100 gig today, and we're looking to going into higher speeds uh, for our next generation chips. A packet comes into the system through the network port. What does that mean? 100 gig packet, that means a 64 bytes every three nanoseconds. A, a load balancer of some sort, which is a part of the hierarchical memory structure, decides what memory to assign that packet to. It's usually one of the SRAM memories that are sitting in the, the four uh, corners of this block diagram. The packet is pushed uh, to an SRAM. Once the SRAM has received the packet, a transactional memory unit that controls the flow of the packets, assigns it to a processor. It will autonomously push the appropriate amount of metadata and first n number of bytes of the packet to the assigned processor and wake that processor up for processing. I don't have time to go into, into all the processing that happens today, but I'll just say there's a big magic uh, block there that basically works on the packet, determines what to do with the packet, whether it has to be encrypted, decrypted, uh, what's next for the packet. But eventually, the processor determines the packet is finished processing and has to egress the system somewhere. It will send a command through a transactional memory unit to schedule the packet for the appropriate uh, egress port, whether that's a host port, whether it's a network port, whether it's a um, further processing on, on another processor within the same uh, chip. So most of the time I wanted to spend today is how do you build up the RISC-V complex to get 1,000 processors? We're starting from the top level and working our way down. So we have a concept of a island. The island is made up of local memory, clusters of RISC-V processors, and slices of cache. 
the operations are divided in, into um, two parts. Standard data processor type applications that are load store, cacheable, that utilizes a tile link protocol and, um, inc and introduces you know, the same um, level one, level two cache that everybody else is used to, backed with a cache on a memory somewhere else higher in the system. And we showed it as the, um, as the level three cache uh, on the previous slide. The other uh, types of operations that are required, we mentioned transactional memory operations coming out of the left-hand side of the um, block diagram here. Those also use the load store instruction set from the clusters, but they form operations that get executed elsewhere, in close to, as possible to the memory. And then there is a operation that re, uh, allows the, the waking up of the RISC-V processor. The cluster is made up of groups of RISC-V processors. In this example, each group contains 10 processors. The process has have the ability to go in several different directions. I mentioned transactional memories. We utilize um, the uh, internal, the island bus interface in this case to generate the transactional memory operations and a data management flow control to, um, to, to support the multiple cache operations uh, for the tile link interface. So, we, so the, at the cluster level, we can support both remote cacheable coherent operations and transactional memory operations. And we roll up the groups in groups of 10 to form 40 at this level, and at the next level, uh, that goes into the island, which you have multiple of these groups, that gets us up to greater than 100 processors per island, and then n number of islands per chip that allow you to get over 1,000 processors per per chip. So what the group is basically made up of the actual risk core with some extensions. We've actually, to one of the big things is if, if you're going to put this many processors on a chip, you've got to be very cognizant of the size of the processor, the size of anything you put on the processor. So a couple of pieces that I wanted to talk about that we've actually simplified. One being the multiply unit. We've actually reduced the size of it and reduced the perform overall performance to have a balance between size and performance for the multiply. We've, we've stripped out the debug capability out of each of the single cores and moved it as a own peripheral block so that one debug unit supports a group of cores to save size. It still gives us the full uh, debug capability about, about debugging any single core on the chip or any group of cores uh, there, but we can't look at all the co all thousand cores at the same time. We evaluated several different uh, cores. We settled in on the RV32IMC and wanted some additional features for bit manipulation commands. We utilized the custom instruction to manage the memory binding operations. One of the limitations of a 32-bit machine that we selected is the fact that it only has a 32-bit address, which wasn't uh, extensive enough for us. So the binding operation that we do that Trans goes from a local CPU address into a global CPU address, expands that address space uh, to greater than 48 bits of address. So we can have a reasonable address space uh, for the processors to access. We also use uh, the custom instructions to support the ability to do the transactional memory operations. So that's the, the method that we're using to set up the instructions and return uh, the instruction, the results of the instruction back, along with the signaling method. We also need some level of user mode in low-level machine mode operation. So we're supporting both of those. One of the examples of that is 
in some applications, we want a higher level of security to not allow every processor in the system to have access to every feature of the system. Uh, we can use the low level mode to trap transactional memory operations and uh, only allow uh, the user mode uh, to execute those through the machine code, machine mode. So I just wanted to put a slide up here that basically talks about what I just said of what are the feature modifications and what did we, what are our plans of actual implementation. So I'm not going to go reread this. So I'll let I'll let this stand as its as its own. But what I do want to go say the RISC V architecture opens up a world of possibilities, and the amount of people here today just demonstrates that a lot. We uh, in the past, over the last 10 years, we ended up doing our own custom processors, and we're in the process of transitioning from an internal custom solution to an open solution. And the RISC V is the first opportunity that allows us to detailing a uh, standard solution to fit our needs. And in summary, the RISC V solution can be tailored to meet the needs of embedded applications for suitable choice of an instruction set feature, privilege modes, and debug modes. And the use of highly optimized transactional memories lends itself to doing a lot of the operations that are more centric to the memories versus the CPUs. And I think the interaction of both of those systems allow RISC-V and SmartNICs to go way over the 100 gig capability of today. One of the things I do want to mention, I want to, um, is the uh, ODSA, uh, which is a um, consortium that we're trying to start up to try to expand the capability of moving open source into open interfaces to allow that standard chip interconnects can be done in a more reasonable, implementable way uh, to help the, the industry. But you can come by the, the booth in, um, and pick up all the information on that. Thank you.